Yes, thank you. Um, we have three uh, presentations today, very interesting talks. Uh, the first one from Scott Wilding uh, from Transport of London on the topic of uh, logistics for urban cons construction sites. Uh, second one from Guillaume Bertrand uh, from Mobility by Colas, the presentation of the use case of regulation of truck flows generated by major construction sites in Lyon, Partieu, and Athletes Village. Uh, for 2024 in Paris Olympic and Paralympic Games. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Rayonen from Forum Virum, mm. uh, yeah. Virum Helsinki is piloting Can you please uh, mute yourself? Everyone is not talking. Sorry, can you mute yourself? <laughs> well, Sato is, uh, will be presenting uh, piloting autonomous deliveries for a construction site. And then ending closing remarks by Rafael Belgiani from Polis. Now I want to ask Scott if you are prepared to give your talk or share your screen. Scott is not here yet, I'm afraid. So let's do a quick change in the agenda and start with Guillaume Bertrand. So I give the okay. floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will share my screen. Please let me know if it works. Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, I will share with you um, the feedback and the experience that we have earned thanks to the deployment of the Kievo solution. Uh, so far, uh, we have deployed it on, on two uh, sites uh, that I will precise later on. Uh, but firstly, I am working at Mobility by Colas, which is a, a business unit that has been created three year, uh, six years sorry, ago uh, at Colas. Colas is a major uh, construction and maintenance company in the road and railway uh, sectors, um, widely spread across the world uh, and present in uh, 50 countries. And for us, for the mobility by Colas, uh, we aim to create new offers and deploy them to our traditional clients so that are public local authorities and to help them um, manage uh, in a better way uh, it could be a uh, road safety it could be uh, uh, to ease traffic management uh, when uh, important work sites take place in urban city centers uh, or to um, ease uh, multimodal uh, mobility so as said in the introduction, we have deployed Kievo so far in two uh, main cities in France, uh, so in Paris and in uh, Lyon. Um, a few words about Lyon, uh, since my presentation will be mainly focused on the Paris example. So about Lyon, uh, it is the, the most uh, long running uh, project that we have. Uh, it has been deployed uh, since uh, 2018 uh, and is still uh, running. Uh, so we had up to 50 different operations that has been included in the, in the process of uh, Kievo. Uh, and Kievo has a different name uh, locally uh, because uh, they have uh, chosen their own brand that is Reguli regularly for regulation and D that is the first letter two letters of uh, Lyon um, so thanks to this uh, system uh, what we are aiming and what we have succeeded to to do is to uh, really plan before and manage on the D-Day uh, the trucks flows that are coming to the work sites to very different work sites, but that are located in a precise uh, uh, district, and that otherwise, without the system, would have 
been generated uh, a lot of new events uh, like uh, um, uh, traffic jams, uh, parkings on uh, uh, on curbs, and so on. So uh, I will take the example of the Athletes uh, Olympic Village near Paris in Saint Denis. So that was what it looked like uh, at the at the early stages. Uh, so uh, two years ago, uh, and now it is becoming more and more like that uh, since the uh, Olympic Games are really uh, close now from us. So how we do so and what we have deployed to uh, manage the track flows coming to, um, to these work sites. So, uh, we, I will detail the diagram that is on the right. So the main contributors are in fact directly the operations and all the contractors and companies. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. So all the contractors and companies that are involved on the different work sites and operations of the athletes village has directly an access and a role to play in the solution since they will um, enter their own uh, demands on a common and shared uh, live schedule. Uh, imagine it uh, as a Dr. Lib or an Outlook schedule that is uh, lively updated thanks to uh, other, all the contributors that are taking uh, schedules, uh, slots in the schedule for their own deliveries. By doing so, we manage directly, the, we avoid the conflict between two reservations. Um, thanks to that, so we have a planning that is done before, that is done, um, up to uh, 15 days before the effective delivery. So we can uh, plan uh, easier. Um, thanks to this reservation, we also deliver uh, and create uh, a delivery protocol. So that is the step zero on the left. And I will show you uh, in what consists uh, a delivery protocol. It is really a new document uh, complementary to the delivery uh, uh, bill. Uh, but here we are talking about a protocol since it describes the steps that the truck driver must follow to deliver this site. Uh, later on, the truck driver can download an application. So we have partnered with uh, B Mobile that is editing the solution TrackMeister that we have customized to our own need. So thanks to this application, it can scan the QR code that is on the delivery protocol and uh, have a, a truck dedicated route that guides him uh, from his uh, initial location to a regulation area that is located in the suburb of uh, the, the city. So for instance, for the Saint-Denis uh, work sites, uh, we have a regulation area that is located in Gennevilliers. Gennevilliers is uh, 15 minutes um, away apart from Saint-Denis and is really less crowded uh, because there is already a very important uh, port and industrial activities, so it is fully scaled for trucks, uh, which is a big difference with uh, Saint Denis. Uh, so at this regulation area, we uh, we get to know the identity of the driver, his name, uh, first name, last name, also the license plate uh, of the truck. Uh, and his phone number. So at this stage, we know uh, the identity of the driver and we can contact him. Um, at this stage also, we check with the worksite if he can accept the delivery. 
if it's all right, we let the truck um, start from the regulation area to do, go directly to the worksite. That is the 15 minute uh, uh, destination. But if the worksite has a problem, we can ask him to wait 30 minutes, one hour, two hour on the regulation area, which is a, um, a safe space to park with the engine off and it won't affect the work sites and its uh, surroundings. And even during the last, uh, last mile, we could say a trip, we can call the driver or send him notification if he has downloaded the application to reroute him or even to say to him to go back to the regulation area because the work site uh, has a problem with uh, a crane or with an access uh, or so on. Um, all that to make the trucks come when everything is ready on the work site to uh, have a, a quick delivery and effective delivery. So it is just in time management. So here I put some uh, models of delivery protocol. You can see the QR code. Uh, it is written in French, but also in English. All these are fully uh, uh, customizable depending on the country and the language that are able to speak the drivers and the operations. Uh, so it explains that you have to respect a specific delivery method here. Here, there is a, uh, an access control, so you need a code and so on. You can use the application. Uh, and it tells you when you need to uh, go to the step one, to the regulation area, and then to your website. Also, what we have deployed specifically for the, the, the Kievo adaptation for the Athlete Village, that is called Fluideo, and that is the name that you can see here. Uh, we have specifically deployed a new feature that is targeting not only the trucks, but also the vans um, that are coming, uh, both for delivering small goods to the work sites, but also uh, uh, that are uh, um, for the workers uh, that come uh, at the end of the of the of the works uh, for the. Uh, the last months of works um, that are not using uh, uh, concrete, uh, earth, and so on, but mostly uh, smaller goods. So we have a parking protocols also that helps the, the, the operations to manage the parking of small vehicles also, because they could generate a huge congestion in the neighborhood. So here I put some pictures. The first one is the parking lot. So the regulation area that we have in Genvilliers. As you can see, if a, if a truck is parked here for four hours, it won't affect at all the, the traffic uh, in uh, Saint-Denis. It won't cause the uh, uh, noise, uh, pollution, and so on. Uh, here you have the control access uh, that is located at the, both at the entrance and at the um, exit of the regulation area. So uh, there is a, a license plate reading camera, a barrier, of course, um, also a, an IP a communication uh, device that helps in case of a problem to contact the regulation center that is located in Saint-Denis, but it can be fully uh, remotely operated. Uh, and that avoid a uh, uh, lot of uh, human cost, for instance, it could be uh, all concentrated. And here you have a, a, a device that can scan the QR code. So the drivers come by with this um, delivery protocol, he scan it, and if it's the right truck, the right time, the right day, of course, the barrier will open uh, and he, he can uh, come in. Uh, and it's the same at the exit. 
if he scan and it's the right timing, the work site is okay to accept him, the barrier will open. And if not, we will give him instruction if he need to wait or, or any other solution. So if we uh, give you uh, key figures about Fluideo, we have integrated more than 40 different operations. So it is really not linked to only a, a Bouygues or Eiffage, let's say, but it is really um, uh, independent from any uh, company. And all the companies that are working on a big construction site can be involved in the solution. Um, so among these 14 operations, more than 90 different companies and subcontractors had access to uh, enter the needs of deliveries. Uh, and we have managed up to uh, 600 uh, truck trips per day. So uh, as you can see, with such a, a flow, uh, it, it would mostly, uh, surely have generated a lot of trouble uh, in this area. Uh, so far, so you have the total counts, and also it benefited uh, both the operations and the residents because it uh, avoided a, a lot of uh, traffic jam and noise and uh, and safety issues. Uh, and for the end, I will show you a video, and uh, we will uh, hear the client. Sorry, Julian. Julian. Sorry, may I interrupt? Uh, how long is this video? Four minutes. Four minutes, OK. It's OK? Because we have two questions. Maybe we should take them first. Ah, OK. Yeah. Sure. Um, first one uh, is, uh, what is the typical gross vehicle weight of the trucks, and how much weight can they load? Uh, uh, we manage uh, a every type of vehicles. It could be a single carriage, dual carriage. It could be uh, small trucks. It's uh, we have uh, different uh, sizes of trucks that can be uh, filled uh, when the reservation is done. Okay, thank you. Um, and how many overweight, more than 45 tons, HD HDT and other trucks are coming per day? Overweight and oversized. I don't have this information, sorry. Okay. And the last question, what means right time? How many hours earlier are they allowed to sign in? Ah, um, uh, yeah, you are right about this question because um, trucks, especially the ones that are coming from far away, from other countries, for instance, uh, tends to arrive uh, very early in the morning. It could be five, it could be uh, six, uh, even if their delivery is scheduled at uh, 10 or 11. Uh, so, so we have seen that really we can offer this service of welcoming them on the regulation area that transform itself a bit in service area because there are toilets, there is a kitchen and so on. Uh, all of this is customizable, of course. Um, but yeah, the, the trucks can, drivers can come by uh, early and it is uh, customizable. It is uh, just a matter of settings and of uh, will to transform it into a service area. OK, thank you. So is it OK for the video? Yes, I think, Sato, you said yeah. that your presentation would be a little bit shorter, so let's run the video. I Thank hope you. it's okay with you. L'idée de l'outil Fudeo est née dans le contexte d'une réflexion à l'organisation du village des athlètes avec ses différents secteurs, sa douzaine de mètres d'ouvrage, chacun ayant son propre objectif de planning. Donc il nous fallait un outil qui nous permette de fédérer les différents acteurs, travailler à une logique de planning en commun et donc une planification commune et partagée avec une hiérarchisation des livraisons et de la logistique du dernier kilomètre plus globalement. Fluideo, c'est un outil 
qui va favoriser l'acceptabilité des chantiers en permettant de réguler les flux de camions de chantier grâce à de la planification amont et de la gestion le jour J pour faire arriver les camions en juste attente sur les chantiers. Donc ici, nous sommes en zone très contrainte puisque aux, aux portes de Paris, et nous avons 500 à 600 passages de camions par jour qui viennent alimenter ces chantiers. Donc il est important de fournir à la fois un service aux livreurs avec une application dédiée qui va les faire passer par les bons itinéraires, euh, un top départ qui est donné au bon moment pour qu'ils arrivent en juste à temps sur les chantiers et qu'on puisse monitorer ça grâce à une application côté PC de régulation où on a le suivi effectif de ces livreurs. Donc Fluideo est une adaptation locale de notre service Kievo qui est proposé par Mobility by Colas depuis un peu plus de trois ans. Donc pour bâtir et opérer la solution Fluideo, on est allé chercher les meilleures solutions déjà existantes sur le marché et on les a fait passer à cette échelle multi-chantier. Donc on est allé chercher Timothy sur la planification amont de livraison de chantier, Bimobile sur l'application livreur et le tracking des camions. Et sur les moyens humains, on a Logisure qui est en co-traitance avec nous et qui opère cette régulation au quotidien. Le défi est vraiment d'avoir l'adhésion de toutes les opérations, de les rendre acteurs de cette régulation, sans quoi le système ne fonctionnerait pas. Donc il faut bien montrer à ces opérations que la régulation est un enjeu de tous pour avoir ces livraisons en juste à temps au chantier. PC Régulation, bonjour. Euh, on a eu le chantier, vous pouvez partir dans 5 minutes. Euh, déjà, ça nous permet euh, de suivre en fait euh, tous les trajets euh, des, euh, des véhicules qui viennent livrer, depuis leur lieu de chargement jusqu'à l'aire de régulation et jusqu'à euh, la ZAC euh, du village olympique. On peut leur envoyer directement des informations en cas d'aléa sur le trajet et aussi s'il y a besoin de les faire attendre un peu plus sur euh, l'aire euh, de régulation. Pour les indicateurs, on se base sur le taux d'enregistrement des livraisons des entreprises et aussi sur leur, le taux de passage des livraisons classiques sur l'aire de régulation de Genevilliers. On a aussi un indicateur pour le taux de carbone émis par les véhicules. Nous avons un enjeu majeur de sécurité sur le village des athlètes, sécurité des compagnons, des différents acteurs, mais aussi sécurité du public et des riverains dans ce milieu urbain dense. Donc l'organisation des flux logistiques participe à prévenir les accidents liés aux déplacements. Et enfin, nous avons une ambition environnementale forte avec des objectifs de réduction d'émissions de CO2 en organisant ainsi les livraisons et limitant les risques de circulation en attendant que le point de livraison se libère pour le chauffeur. Donc le projet a démarré dans le cadre de la notification d'un marché public en mai 2021 et il va couvrir toute la phase de travaux du chantier du village. Donc nous livrons les ouvrages fin 2023 avec une levée de réserve premier trimestre 2024. Okay, thank you very much. Very impressive. Interesting. Um, now we are a bit uh, after time, so I will not, by further delay, introduce Scott Wilding from Transport of London to share with us some experiences from London on logistics and urban construction sites. So please, Scott, share your screen and the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, please, a uh, reminder, you. put your, put your uh, questions in the chat. And if we have time, we, we take it uh, live. Otherwise, perhaps, Scott, you will answer them in the chat afterwards. Sorry. Of course. Thank and you. And now I'll, try and be, I'll try and be brief so that you can uh, have time for questions. Um, can everyone see and hear me? And yes. I think my presentation is on the screen. I can see it. But can, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. I'm not driving it. So if you could just skip on to the next slide, please. So my presentation today is, uh, I know we're talking about construction logistics, but before I go into that, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background about how London works and uh, the background to some of our key policies. That will inform our experience on construction logistics and help you give a uh, a more informed picture. So next slide, please. So first one is London's governance. Next slide, please. 
So London is quite a complicated city. Uh, we have a directly elected mayor who is Sadiq Khan and uh, 25 uh, Greater London Assembly members and they are the government for London which should be fairly straightforward but we also have 33 independent London boroughs each made up of around 300,000 people. They in turn also have a leader and uh, around 60 uh, elected uh, councillors. So there's about 1,500 uh, councillors in London, around 33 borough leaders, 25 GLA members, uh, one directly elected mayor. We also have a Lord Mayor of the City of London. So the governance of London is really, really complicated. Um, and if you were setting up a world city, that's really not how you would do it, but it's the situation London finds itself in. Um, London, so Transport for London, which is who I work for, we sit in the middle and we try to turn the mayor's policies into actual things on the ground, things that will work. But we have to do that in correspondence uh, and partnership with both the GLA and the London Borough so that everyone is taken on that journey with us. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you a couple of key facts on London and the freight uh, activity in London. Next slide, please. So uh, some good news is that freight is getting safer in London. Um, between 2017 and 2019, we had 45% reduction in uh, fatal collisions between HGVs and vulnerable road users. So those are those who walk cycle uh, and use motorcycles. And that has fallen again between 2020 and 2022. It's not a perfect picture, but it is for any transport authority to stand before any audience and say that things are safer now than they were 10 years ago is a good thing. Uh, the other thing that on, on sort of the mayor's agenda is uh, pollution, um, because freight still makes up around a third of all NOx emissions, but things are cleaner than they were, say, in 2010. And congestion is still a very real issue for London, where about 30% of all trips uh, in London are freight uh, trips. And as you can see on that graph, 89% of everything that is moved in London happens by road. Now that's important because Transport for London only owns and operates 5% of London's road network. The other 95% are owned, operated and maintained by those London boroughs that I spoke about earlier. Um, I won't go into the uh, uh, other bits and pieces, but essentially most freight trips in London are happening between 7am and 1pm. And we have a job to try and get those freight trips out of that peak and uh, hopefully overnight or, or sort of later in the day. So that's a very, very brief picture of what London looks like and how it operates. Next slide, please. Uh, key so key mayoral policies um, that we are enacting to tackle some of the issues that we have in London. One is to reduce uh, killed and seriously injured by around 60% uh, by next year. Uh, and we are not, well, we are on track to do that for freight trips, but not overall. So it's not a perfect picture. There is far more that we can do to reduce fatalities in terms of uh, improving pollution. The mayor bought in the ultra low emission zone this year, which has seen uh, pollution, uh, particularly harmful particulates fall significantly. But this was only brought in in August and there is uh, far more monitoring to be done. But those two things, safety and pollution, are where Transport for London has sort of key levers that it can pull, key policies that it can, it can really directly influence. The one that is much more tricky is to try and reduce congestion. We have a target to reduce all freight uh, activity in the central zone of London by 10% uh, to 2026. And there is no single lever that we can pull to, uh, to enact that. So we have to do a variety of things, working with water and rail, retiming, procurement, all of those sorts of things. Um, and uh, that is something that is a challenge for, for us in London, but it's something that we are working on. So those are the three main ca uh, mayoral key areas. Next slide, please. Uh, and if you are uh, particularly interested, 
The key policy documents are the Freight and Servicing Action Plan, which is the picture in the centre, which uh, sets out all of London's uh, key uh, actions to take to improve both uh, congestion, reduce pollution and improve road safety. So that's, uh, that's a very brief canter through of the, the overall picture. Uh, next slide, please. And I will now talk about construction logistics, which is what I think we're, we're all here to do. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, the way that London handles construction in the city is essentially through what's called clocks. It's the construction logistics and community safety standard. It is a now a national standard set up by Transport for London with the freight and uh, construction industry. Its aim primarily was to reduce fatalities because London had a problem and in some ways still does uh, have a problem where HGVs, heavy goods vehicles, are significantly uh, involved in collisions with, with vulnerable road users. And this was set up to try and redu to reduce those collisions between construction traffic and vulnerable road users. That was its first aim. Um, it's become something a bit more. Um, we tried to improve air quality. We've tried to uh, ensure that all the freight uh, construction traffic is on the, on the right route at the right time. But, that, but it's, its primary aim, Clox's primary aim, was to try and reduce fatalities. And that's why it was set up. So next slide, please. So the background to clocks is that Transport for London set it up about 10 years ago. Um, it was paid for by the London taxpayer. It uh, looked at the whole journey for construction traffic. So the United Kingdom has a very, very good safety record once you're on the construction site itself. But the journey to the construction site was largely ignored. Uh, and when we started to investigate, uh, we found that construction traffic, uh, particularly HGVs over 12 tonnes, had a disproportionate uh, record with collisions with, with uh, vulnerable road users. So we decided to look at the whole supply chain journey and how could we make the whole journey safer. Uh, that was set up by Transport Plant about 10 years ago. We found that there was a lack of awareness of the problem the general consensus was that well if i've got a construction site that's what i need to focus on not the journey to it so there was um there was a lot of stuff that we could try and do to make that whole journey safer and that was part of of Klox's, uh conception uh so next slide please so we set up the clock standard now that is a standard that uh, responsible constructors in the capital city had to sign up to. Uh, it uh, really was a, a, a piece of best practice that uh, evolved uh, to become a code of practice. And we insisted that if anyone was constructing anything for Transport for London, they would have to use it. We persuaded those London boroughs to take that on board and asked them to ensure that uh, they would, would um, ask their constructors to become part of it. And then it became part of a sort of a snowball, really. It wasn't something that we could enforce. It wasn't something that we could force on the construction industry. It was something that we had to persuade, we had to ask. But by and large, the construction industry took this on board and became members and signed up to this, this standard. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, and we also initiated what's called construction logistics plans. These were um, plans which would be submitted by a constructor to a city authority, outlining how they would get their construction goods from uh, origin to the site itself, ensuring that they were using the safest vehicle on the, on the best route. And now we try to ensure that they are using the cleanest vehicle. Um, the amount of uh, construction traffic generated in the capital uh, in London um, has, has reduced since 2016, but has also, there's been a slight uptick in how we, how the city operates, going from uh, principally offices to perhaps residential. Um, and that has required uh, an uptick in the number of freight uh, construction vehicles that we have. Uh, and our 
mayor's aim is that uh, no one is seriously in killed or injured on london's road network by 2041 so we have a vision zero policy and this is a key um a key lever that we need to ensure works in order to meet that mayoral policy so next slide please so construction logistics plans um, are outlined uh, through that document and they are available on the on the website they've been well received uh, the planned measures are there to minimize vehicle trips and reduce opportunities for collisions with vulnerable road users They've been around now for, I think, nearly a decade. Um, they're well received, they're well understood, and uh, we, we run uh, training courses for, how, uh, for, for constructors um, so that they can be well aware of how to complete these and what is expected of them. Um, this is also now a national standard. Um, TfL, through, um, through need rather than desire, uh, because we didn't have any money, uh, couldn't fund this anymore. So we handed it over to the industry who fund it, and it has become a national standard, not just a London standard. And indeed, Clocks now has links with Australia and New Zealand. So this is something that Transport for London has not only been able to export the idea to uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, it is one that the London taxpayer no longer funds. It's now funded by the construction industry. And it is a um, idea that is now taking root in uh, places like Australia and New Zealand. So it's been successful in that way, um, but it's not perfect. Um, there are, are uh, things that we could do much better. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, and the one that we could principally do much better on is compliance. So where we do very well is um, constructors like to and want to sign up to the clocks standard. They like and want to have the uh, advertising on their trucks and on their, their boardings at construction sites. They sign up to the construction logistics plans. They're well presented, well made. Um, they are submitted to city authorities um, and that allows the constructors to get their, almost their planning permission. Um, but where we could do much better is on monitoring because it's almost as if you've 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 signed up you filled in the form you've got you've, you you enact the uh the the policies but are they working and the monitoring is much much harder because uh you're asking contractors and constructors to uh ensure that the the goods got to the site on time and uh you know that there were no there were no incidents um and that is extra uh, sort of paperwork that many constructors are reluctant to undertake, not all of them, um, but some of them. And that's an area that we could perhaps do better in. Uh, but by and large, Clocks has been um, a success story for London over the last 10 years. And the takeaway points are that it's no longer a London policy. It's a UK wide policy. It's funded by the construction industry, not by the public purse. Uh, and uh, it is a well-received scheme, but we could do better on how we monitor how it works. So that is a, a run through construction industry uh, logistics in London and how we deal with it. I'll pause there uh, because I can see there are some questions. So shall I take those uh, now? Is that, is that a good idea? Yes, thank you for an excellent presentation and impressive uh, work that you've done, uh, especially getting the industry involved and engaged and uh, we have one quick question um, are there uh, is there any policy or trial on night delivery for logistic sites as you mentioned to remove traffic from peak, peak hours um, so we have uh, an overnight delivery what we call out of hours it doesn't have to be overnight it's out of hours delivery scheme um, it's called retiming it's appropriate for some um, elements but Clearly, uh, London uh, has a restriction on construction activity between 7 p.m. at night to 7 a.m. in the morning, and that is to ensure that uh, residents can get a good night's sleep, but also it is safe to construct, because um, it's much safer to construct in daylight than it is in the dark. Um, and so it, it, it's appropriate for some parts of construction, perhaps the fitting out, 
but not the actual concrete glass and steel construction. Um, so limited, um, uh, limited effect, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, yes, another one regarding CLP. How do you define the use of cleanest vehicles? Uh, so London has a standard, the, the uh, ultra low emission zone, which all vehicles entering it must adhere to. That's been around for all vehicles since uh, August and for, for uh, heavy goods vehicles or freight vehicles really for about uh, 18 months, two years. So we ensure that the cleanest vehicles are, are entering the capital through, um, through, a, through a law. Um, you can't enter the capital city unless you, you have a certain, uh, I think it's Euro 6 engine. Um, that's what London has decided to do. Um, the construction logistics plans outside of London, where that, that law doesn't exist, uh, seeks to uh, reward those, um, those constructors that use the cleanest vehicles and seeks to persuade them through best practice. So answer is in London, it's a law, you have to comply. Outside of London, it's more about best practice and persuasion. Okay, and if it's quick, do you incentivize a modal shift? Um, not overtly. I mean, we encourage uh, you know, the, the best practice of water and rail, but as I said, uh, the start, London, Transport for London is limited in its powers to force uh, people or constructors to use uh, water, rail and bike. But we do have a scheme in London where some uh, particularly tools are delivered by, uh, by bike uh, to construction sites. Um, so it's not impossible, it's just very, very small. We, ha we don't have the powers to enforce it. So again, it's about persuasion, best practice and encouragement. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I will hand over to uh, Sato Reyonan from Forum Virium in Helsinki, piloting autonomous deliveries or construction sites. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. See. Perfect. Perfect. So, good afternoon on my behalf, also from Helsinki. So my name is Sato Reyonen and I will be bringing you a bit different perspective. So the first presentation was mostly like technical and the second one was more about the standard. And this one is about designing the pilot for, for example, construction sites. So today's agenda is split into three. So we have introduction and then the case example and then conclusions, latter of which will focus on the lessons that we have learned and also the future operations that we are running uh, like right now currently and also in the next spring. So to introduce myself, I am Satu Reunen, the project manager of Helsinki operations in this urban, urban project at Forum Virium Helsinki. Uh, my, my background is more in this data driven design, which will, <laughs> will impact this, uh, this presentation a lot. So Forum Virium Helsinki, which is a city of Helsinki's innovation agency. And it's always looking for partners and projects around sustainability, better urban life and smart mobility. My role as a project manager in EU Horizon funded project Urbane is to manage these operations in Helsinki Lighthouse Living Lab and ensure that our innovations, especially around the last mile solutions will be transferred successfully together with city of Bologna, Thessaloniki and Valladolid to next wave of cities in Barcelona and Karlsruhe by the end of August 2024. So the Helsinki operation started in autumn 2022 when we were preparing the use case for our ADV and cargo bike. Between May and August 2023, the autonomous delivery vehicle manufactured by Twinsfield and operated by Elmad, uh, both French companies, uh, was delivering B2B parcels, mostly tools, from Wirt Center Sörneinen to nearby construction sites. So some parcels came from also DB Schenker, which also provided the cargo bike for our operations. The basic process flow was that the um, construction site worker was ordering tools from
from the word center and then it it was delivered by our ADV or cargo bike to the nearby construction site where the recipient was ready to pick up the parcel. We had a retrospective meeting during which we learned that uh, our deliveries were mostly successful. We got some positive feedback. Our technology was always working and the integration was good. Also, we received positive feedback and attention among residents. However, um, we had this manual data entry, which we have now re been replacing with an integration between LMAD and DB Schenker. We have also highlighted the importance of clear communication between different stakeholders to ensure that we know what, why, and for who we are actually designing our service. So this will mitigate the risk of misunderstanding and also miscommunicating the purpose of the plot pilot and also the value that we're bringing for the end user. So how to do this? We can use, for example, these principles of design thinking. Um, so we started by um, understanding the user. So we must learn their needs and limitations by creating personas, for example, and then collecting insights. Then these will found the basis for defining um, end goals and also the problem itself and those KPIs that we can use to measure our progress. Then we will start brainstorming ideas together with different stakeholders in, for example, workshops and also using service design methodologies. Then we will be refining the best ideas, uh, which will potentially solve the problem the easiest way possible. So only way to solve if we can actually answer these questions or problems that we have, uh, have figured out, then we have to actually test it and start collecting continuous feedback and also um, like data about how we are, are managing with this, um, this pilot. This is the only way to iterate the solution even further. But as an iterative design, we can also make mistakes and uh, like go forward all the time. So it won't always lead to profitable business cases, but will teach us valuable lessons and insights for the future development. In our case, for example, we learned that innovative technology actually isn't enough for the construction workers to give up on their rewarding break when they pick up their own tools from the center themselves. So how we're managing now. So our second iteration is focusing more on B2C deliveries on the area where it's higher demand. We also integrated a modular parcel locker system and started communicating in Finnish with, with the end customers to avoid being seen as a spam message. We have using Christmas um, and also Black Friday season as a marketing mean to increase the volume uh, for deliveries. We'll also use agile framework academical collaboration and service design methodologies to design our third iteration for next spring. Next sprint happening during the next spring. Here you can see that we have received a lot of media visibility and it will be ensuring that we get the continuous feedback to um, improve the quality of our next iteration. So to conclude the learnings about the construction site piloting, uh, here are some, some key points I want to highlight. Um, so you have to always think about how to not assume anything because assumptions might lead to a point in which you might take away those things that the construction workers or the end users find actually meaningful or satisfying about their daily life. And then you'll end up wasting those valuable resources and then you could be utilizing them even better. So instead you should be focusing on solving the issues that the end users actually find exhausting, unpleasant, somehow manual or time consuming. This will then increase the value provision and also preferably even their well-being. 
I would be more than happy to spend more time with you discussing design, data-driven design methodologies in piloting use cases. Um, but we don't have that much time today, so don't hesitate connecting me in, on LinkedIn and reaching out. And also, always find out our website, subscribe to our newsletter, because we are looking for new partners and interesting projects to collaborate in the future. So thank you for your attention and um, wishing you happy holidays that are upcoming. And if we have any time for questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Satu. Very inspiring and uh, important lessons learned uh, that it's all about the end user and the daily work, don't assume. I think that is really a good insight to bring in, uh, to innovation projects. Uh, we have actually one question, and we have time for, for that, actually. Uh, how does the ADV navigate in a changing construction site setting, like dumps, material blocking, etc.? So our um, ADV that we're using, um, it's operated by LMAD, so they know the technical stuff, but um, I know that it has sensors and later cameras. It's always creating this, uh, um, like a digital twin around its surroundings. Uh, but the ADV itself actually didn't go inside the construction site. So it had the pickup point outside the construction site. But then it also has this follow me mode that we didn't pilot during this, this sprint. But it's a possibility to put on this follow me mode and then it could be following you around the construction site if the worker would have probably wanted to have it in some some specific location inside this region because it's super difficult to get the data out of this construction site. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Satu? And there is also this what measures are taken to avoid disruptions in the ADV service due to technological battery oh, failures. Yeah. Um, well, there it is currently located in this uh, container in which it can be al always um, downloaded or like charged and uh, then we are we're always collaborating with the french company this twinsville which is which is maintaining the adv and uh for example now we are collecting feedback how it's working in the snow and also cold it has been doing pretty well yes but there are some issues but we are we're still just uh, collecting the data so that we can say for sure that it can manage during winter time here in Helsinki, which is definitely difficult, more difficult than the summer sprint that we had. Thank you very much. And if there are no other questions, I think that we can close this session of presentations and I will give the final word to Rafaele. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magnus. And uh, also thank you very much from uh, my side, from PolySide, for the presentation of, of the speaker. Very, very interesting, as we could also see how also both the private sector and cities are also uh, more and more also targeting the construction sector, which is often we've been we've seen so far neglected or found less priority compared to other uh, topics regarding logistics. We also heard uh, recently at the, uh, at the police conference that the construction sector cover for some cities, for local authorities, 20% or even more of the whole goods and freight transport there. So it's very important that we also have the opportunity to further discuss between both private sector and public sec sector. And I think these uh, webinars, these opportunities to gather are, are very important for that. So uh, having said that, we wish also to continue the conversation in 2024 within ALIS membership and police membership, as we've done this year through also previous uh, opportun for opportunities for discussion focus also or urban space um, allocation that we had uh, recently a few weeks ago and also con on uh, consumer engagement some months ago so we also wish to continue the conversation in 2024 with more opportunities for uh, police members alice members and also open also to the public as we did today and also we co wish also to continue the conversation in 2024 also with more in-person events so we're also working to have another edition of the urban logistics innovation day that we had in uh, at the end of september in brussels as the final event of the lead project so also we encourage 
also uh, all the European funded projects, the research like we had today uh, represented Urbane to also continue the conversation and discussion to bring uh, the sector, uh, freight sector also more between I think we lost the sound. Can you hear me? No, <clears throat> no, yes. No idea what happened. <laughs> so I hope you could <laughs> listen most of the message. Okay, so basically I was just saying that we wish to continue the conversation and uh, webinars also for 2024 and continue the conversation we had so far, so covering urban construction logistics today, urban space allocation, uh, consumer engagement in the previous months. 